On Zoom to Temtik. Welcome, everyone. My name is Aileen Burns. This is Yuan Lund, and we're co CEOs here at Ramey Modern. And we're so pleased to be here for this panel discussion on the topic of remedi remediation. Hmm. Um, Yuan and I are fortunate to work every day in this great building that overlooks the South Saskatchewan River. Its waters keep us alive and nourishes life from where it starts at the meeting of the Bow and the Old Men Rivers in Alberta to the Saskatchewan Fork, excuse me, the Saskatchewan Forks and far beyond. Kapwani Kiwanga's exhibition, Remediation, has given us an opportunity to give greater attention to the importance of the health of our waterways, soil, and plant life, and to our responsibility to respect, protect, and contribute to the well-being of all living things on these lands, Treaty 6 territories that we share. In addition to acknowledging all people of the treaty, we'd like to pay respects to the Nitsitsi, Nehiawak, Nehithawak, Nehinawak, Nagawe, Dene, Nakoda, Dakota, Lakota, and Métis peoples who have long and important histories on these lands. We pay our respects to Indigenous ancestors and reaffirm our relationships to one another. Uh, I'm delighted to introduce today's speakers. So we have um, Kapwani Kiwanga with us um, virtually. So she'll hear her voice soon as she speaks. So Kapwani is an artist that's emerged um, as a leading figure in the last few years. She um, won the 2018 uh, inaugural artist, uh, um, Freeze Artist Award and the Sobe Art Award. And two year, th no, four years ago, she won the, her prestigious Marcel Duchamp Prix in France. Um, and she's representing Canada at the next Venice Biennale, which is one of the biggest, if not the biggest, um, contemporary art exhibit. So in two and a half months, she'll be taking over the Canadian Pavilion. And that is um, part of the reason she couldn't join us here physically today. She's exceedingly busy. Um, we also have um, with us uh, Dr. Dr. Catherine Stewart, who's Associate Professor at the Department of Soil Science at the University of Saskatchewan and the Chair of the Society of Ecological Restoration in Western Canada. Her research and teaching focuses on remediation and restoration of Arctic, Alpine, boreal, uh, terrestrial environments. As part of her restorative process, she works with industry partners and indigenous communities to find new ways to build relationships that promote collective, um, promote collaborative environmental decision making and community based restoration. We also have. Uh, Graham Strickett with us, who is Associate Professor at the School of Environment and Sustainability, also at the University of Saskatchewan. Graham's research uh, seeks to better understand how different people think about um, the use of water and how their thinking influences behavior and water use. In short, his work uses a range of uh, social science tools to incorporate people's values and attitudes into water science, artistic expression, and policy creation using experimental uh, decision labs. So um, I think it's pretty obvious why they're here. I think a, a key part of uh, Capone's show upstairs, um, it takes its it starts from the work keyhole that uh, looks at both water and soil um, health and science and how we can use plants to um, detoxify and regenerate both soil and water. Excuse me, just to get the conversation going, we'd like all three panelists to take a moment to speak about the role of remediation in your research, your fieldwork, or your artwork. And maybe Kapwani, since we don't see you and we'd love you to be <laughs> present, we can ask you to, to kick off the conversation about remediation since you put the term um, front and center for all of us. Hi there. Can you hear me all? Yeah. Good. Okay. So um, good evening. And first of all, thank you, all of you who are in the room who I cannot see for showing up. Um, and thank you for the invitation and for Kath uh, Catherine and, and Graham for agreeing to be part of the, the conversation. I think when we uh, come for a site visit um, some time ago, um, we were already thinking about how to to 
continue the conversation beyond the exhibition space. Um, and so I'm very happy that we can, you know, not I can't physically be here today, but that we can at least, um, you know, speak a bit more about some of the ideas behind this. So for me, remediation um, <clears throat> was something, you know, finding a title for a, uh, an exhibition is always a bit painful for me. It takes me some time. Um, but this came really quickly, um, I think, because the the intention and the interest was very clear from the very beginning for me, this idea of remediation, which I think in a very practical way, um, we are looking at the environment, so the water, soil, and earth, I'm sorry, earth, soil, water, uh, air, that um, that surrounds us as a material, but I think it's also more a philosophical or a relational kind of question about how, how we can um, repair or... Um, heal um, also social, um, political, uh, economic uh, unbalances as well. So that's something that I've continued in, in, since this exhibition and, and other thinkings and other projects, and it's something I'm I'm really thinking a lot about. So remediation for me is kind of this way to try to not repair, because I don't think anything, things that are that are sometimes there's violences or, or um, imbalances um, environmentally, but I think also socially, um, that have to be acknowledged, but I don't know if they can always be um, made right, but at least there should be some thought uh, gone into how to be in, in a different kind of relationship and a more, um, yeah, a healthier one. So it's a question of balance, I suppose, for me, I guess is an easy way to say it as mediation for me is is more tending towards this, this constant flux of trying to find a balance which is um, supports life in, in, in all spaces. I guess that's it for me. I think I'll turn next to Catherine, since um, not only do you research remediation, undertake it, but it seems in dialogue with community. So maybe there are some linkages there with the kind of social, political, and scientific kinds of remediation that interests Kapwani. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you very much, first of all, for having me on the panel today. Um, I'm really excited to to talk about this topic because I think it's something that's uh, quite close to my heart. Um, when when I think about remediation, uh, for me as a scientist, I use remediation uh, as a word to explain when we're dealing with contaminants in the environment. And uh, I also sometimes talk about restoration, which is restoring uh, a degraded habitat. Um, or environment. Um, and so sometimes remediation and restoration can go hand in hand. They can be concurrent um, or they can be sequential depending on your, your situation. Um, but when I uh, think about my work and um, when I'm, I'm starting talking with undergraduate students about remediation and restoration, um, I always say to them, I think Remediation and restoration are are rooted really in three key things, um, and the the first one is conservation. So a lot of the restoration and remediation work that's been developed in in North America um, has come out of the conservation movement, which is interesting because it says there's a certain value that's underlying this practice about recognizing the value of um, intact ecosystems. Um, the other uh, key root that I always mention is relationships. And so uh, from a Western scientific perspective, we're looking at relationships between soil microbes and the nutrients in the soil. We're looking at relationships between plant roots and soil microbes. We're looking at relationships between plants and how they might facilitate each other. Um, but we're also really talking about our relationship with nature and what is that relationship. Uh, what is our uh, sense of uh, what our responsibility is to restore some of these degraded habitats. Um, and I also include in that category of relationship our relationships with each other, um, because I think that's critical in um, how we sometimes have ended up in situations where uh, remediation and restoration um, can really trigger social justice issues. Um, and also in how do we talk to each other about our understanding about the natural world from different worldviews, from different knowledge systems um, to support that practice. And so the last route that I always refer to is reconciliation. 
Um, to me, the practice of restoration is also a practice of reconciliation. It's about how are we reconciling our relationship with the natural world and how are we reconciling our relationships with each other. Um, and within Canada and Northern Canada, where I do a lot of work, um, it really directly links to uh, reconciliation with Indigenous communities in this country. Uh, very enlightening. Catherine, thanks so much for sharing. Graham, I wonder if you could speak similar to what, what remediation means in your research and your practice. Yeah, thanks. And thanks for being here, folks, and thanks for the invitation. Um, I think w when I was thinking about these questions and, you know, thinking about what re remediation is in my work, the first thought I had was, you know, we have to not break things first. Like, we have to, like keep ecosystems intact because if we break them they're really really hard to put back um we can but we can't ever um return an ecosystem back to kind of what it was before we intervened and so a lot of the work i've been doing with a large team of people in particular with tim jardine and others in the saskatchewan river delta is looking at how the development upstream has impacted that ecosystem. So it's kind of, you know, at the bottom of a very large watershed, um, which takes water off of the Rocky Mountains. And there's kind of three big things that are impacting that ecosystem and the people that live there who are um, Cree or Swampy Cree people. And it's an area that actually intersects with treaties four, five, six, and 10. So it's quite a like interesting historical political boundary, as well as one of the first, um, European settlements in Western Canada at Cumberland House. And the people who have lived there have watched over about the last 60 years um, since the um, since the dams were built on the South Saskatchewan River, they've watched that ecosystem decline. And the cause of that decline is kind of three big things um, and then some smaller things. And the biggest one is the change in seasonality of flows. So uh, Gardner Dam and Lake Diefenbaker, essentially it's the largest control on the on the water system and it reverses the flows so whereas historically you would have had a gradual um, increase in flow into the spring in two peaks a local runoff and then the runoff from the rocky mountains coming a few weeks later and then slowly tapering off into the fall and then really low flows in the winter now it's almost completely reversed so you have much higher flows in the winter than you used to have, which causes a lot of impacts for fish, um, for erosion, for um, animals that live kind of in the riparian areas. And then the other um, big impact is the lack of sediment. So all the sediment that's that the rivers are carrying are being stored in those reservoirs. Um, and that means that the delta uh, isn't really functioning as a delta anymore. It's becoming a single river channel. And then the wetlands become disconnected from the main river. And then they lack oxygen and nutrients, which they need to sort of produce life. Um, and then the third big impact is the daily fluctuations at E.B. Campbell Dam. So it's a hydro peaking facility. And those daily impacts, um, probably the, the main impact is on fish. So the fish get stranded on the, on the riverbank when the water comes down. And that happens twice a day when we wake up in the morning and we're showering and cooking and doing all the stuff. There's an energy demand. And so they peak the dam to meet that energy demand. Um, and they do that twice a day. And so it's pretty sad, um, but they're killing somewhere between 500,000 and 1.2 million fish a year with the operation of that facility. And that's a hard thing to you know, acknowledge. And if you're from the community who's watched slowly over time as this ecosystem has declined, you know, they really kind of ask the question, like, why are we continuing to let this happen? Um, and the, you know, it's, there's a whole language and culture that's attached to that place. And there's a, a sub dialect of Cree known as Swampy Cree that is specific to that place because it's wet. So it's a little bit different than Plains Cree. Um, and as the ecosystem declines, you know, less and less people want to go out onto the land. And so from a remediation perspective, there's lots of things that can be done. You can um, try to go back to a more naturalized flow in the water resource management upstream, um, eliminate hydro peaking. Um, so that daily peaking, and that could be done either using battery storage 
um, or with a what's known as a balancing pool, where you build another reservoir below the dam so that you're not peaking. You just sort of buffer that flow coming out of the dam. Um, so those are remediation practices. And then the big one, the really hard one is the sediment. How do you move enough sediment from Lake Diefenbaker back to the Delta where it's kind of where it used to end up? And that can be done, but it's very expensive. Um, it's something like a hundred train cars per day, um, that are being lost and the river used to do that for free. So it's a, it's that's sort of grand challenges for remediation. And the other thing that struck me with, um, Kapwani's exhibit is the, um, the plants that were that they, the, the big sort of, um, elliptical, I'm trying to remember the name of the, 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 the piece elliptical field that thank, makes thank you the, the elliptical field piece. agave yeah it's made out of that sizal and, and in the delta actually there's um uh, an invasive grass called phragmites australis which is imported from australia um and it's voracious and it's taking over in the riparian zones and um the communities are trying to do things like burning it but also maybe turning it into something of value um, because it's hard to get rid of it just by burning it. The roots go down really, really deep and the, and it just chokes out all the native plants. Um, for example, one of the impacts of that is that when muskrats make their houses out of it, the, the, the reeds have hollow cores rather than with like a sort of spongy material, like you'd see in sedges. And so when they make their homes out of it, it doesn't have the same insulation value. And so they freeze in their homes. And the muskrat populations, which used to be into the millions, are down to almost nothing. So it's a, another signal that there's lots of things going wrong. But it's not too late. And the communities are doing more local efforts to reconnect channels to the main river, as, all, as well as you know, advocating to people upstream to change the operations of the way the river is managed. Yeah, that's... Um... Yeah, it's a very um, lot of food for thought in terms of this. It's, I, yeah, it's it's so ironic when we build our hydro dams. You know, it's now especially these days when we're trying to move away from fossil fuels. It's you know seen as a clean energy, but of course there are so many other effects when it comes to and there is you know there is no clean energy in a sense. There's there's it's always a compromise. Something has to give, so we just have to. Um, and the big challenge is, of course, use less. That's and that, but that never seems to be on the table. You know, never use less electricity, less gas, or something like that, because that goes against the way we've conceived of the economy currently. So, but I want to ask Abroni. I mentioned Keyhole in my introduction, but I want to um, maybe you can talk a bit about some of the three key works in the exhibition because they touch upon a lot of the things that Graham and. And Catherine has already talked about. So there's water, there's air, there's earth or soil. Um, so keyhole has both soil and water. Elliptical field is um, this uh, set of sculptures made from um, the fiber of the agave plant. And then there's scorch, which obviously uses, um, oh, here we see images, uh, uses kind of uh, burning uh, or, or um, fire to to seal wood in this case but of course it, it so many cultures all around the globe has used um fire as a way to uh, to regenerate or to to seal or to in other ways kind of treat um the environment or, or material so maybe Kavani, do you want to talk a little bit about those three key works just touching upon yeah. where they came from and what you know what kind of conversations you're wanting to start yeah. with those Sure. Um, I think as we we're having a, a look at uh, an image of um, elliptical fields now, I'll I'll probably speak to that. Excuse me, I'm just going to cough a bit. Oh. Apologize. Um, so um, elliptical fields, what you see here is in, indeed sizal, um, and sizal originally comes from. Oh, excuse me. Um, originally comes from Yucatan region in in Mexico. And it's kind of been was imported um, to the Americas, but mostly um, in, in Africa. And I first came across <clears throat> the plant. Sorry, I've got a, a frog stuck in my throat. <clears> throat> uh, was um, brought to Tanzania, where I first encountered it a couple um, well, about fifteen years ago. 
Um, and the way it came of came about was through um, German settlers who had start, uh, started plantations there. Um, and it was kind of came via Kew Gardens, which is an important, um, I guess, botan botanical teaching uh, and research garden in um, in London. Um, but from this, you know, illegally imported uh, uh, sisal plant developed a really big economy. And it's one of the most important um, or was uh, one of the most important economies um, for Tanzania um, and through very different political um I'd say structure. So first from a kind of a British colonial protectorate. Um, so first, sorry, first um, German settlers and then into the British protectorate. And finally, when independence came came along, um, a socialist government that was really using um, the export of um, sisal to stay non-aligned, to stay as independent as one could uh, during the Cold War, to not be aligned with either the East or the West. So through this particular sisal plant, I thought it, I was trying to think, and I often in my work think about plants as witnesses to um, our human history, um, and seeing kind of sisal being almost a material archive of these different economic and political changes uh, in uh, in Tanzania, but of course being a, a plant that has come from elsewhere. Um, what also I, I enjoyed about the working with this material is that it, it is a material which is in between. It's no longer the plant. It's not become this um, manufactured, industrialized product. Uh, it often becomes, you know, um, rope or it could be used for carpeting and things like this. But in this case, it's really this potential, it could be something else. It's in this in-between stage. Um, and it also speaks, I think, to this question of uh, relationships between different um, places. Um, some places, you know, produce or are, there's extraction of raw material. In other places, there's this more refined or um, industrialized um, processing of different materials. In this case, the sizal itself is really left in its not its, I wouldn't say natural or a live state, but it's 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 raw um, material. Um, <clears throat> and so I think that's what um, one of, I guess, the entries into my works is to think about um, materials and plants as as really, as I said, as witnesses to to our human um, history. Um, and so that was one of the, the interests that I had in in, in showing um, the sizal here, and that, and that link, of course, of the the I guess the global. Um, migration of plants and people um, and how they're all intertwined. And as um, um, was mentioned, um, you know, about the Astra, I don't know the name of the, the plant, I've forgotten, sorry, if you could remind me, Graham, of the Australia something or other, which is now in, in the rivers. Uh, these questions of introducing, you know, a new member to uh, to an ecosystem is, is going to have effects. Um, so those questions um, also come up from the, the, the question of the migration of, of plants, you know, either uh, accidentally or intentionally, um, et cetera. Uh, the another work I think that we mentioned was Keyhole, and I don't know if we have an image of that or not, but it's um, a, for those who haven't seen the exhibition yet, uh, it's, I guess, concentric, almost circles or arcs of um, of metal, uh, and in those there's plants that are um, in either in water and or soil, um, that are all photoremediators. So they're all plants that somehow um, extract um, heavy heavy metals um, from water or, or soil. And the design itself of the, the sculpture um, was really inspired by Keyhole uh, Gardens, a kind of um, a design that was developed in Lesotho, so Southern Africa. Um, at the height of the HIV um, epidemic, when when people could not go to their normal plots to uh, to have their subsistence plots to to, to feed themselves, um, this was a way to bring a very um, a heavy nutrient um, soil. So there'd be um, compost would be in the center, and that would allow um, for kind of a permaculture, which allow to have you know people's kind of garden kitchen uh, very close to them um, because they were. Um, uh, weakened by by the by the disease and not able to necessarily travel as far out to their plots and and, and sustain themselves. So this really simple um, design of having, you know, this small scale cycle of having you know material which is uh, deteriorating and then and creating a very um, rich soil to allow to have very nutritious food um, to take care of 
or to feed people as best as they could so that their own bodies could do their best um, to to boost their immune their uh, immune system, which was uh, failing them, seemed to be also very very um, inspiring for me in terms of thinking about these small steps to to acknowledge um, uh, these moments of crisis and imbalance, um, and then trying to do what one can uh, to to sustain life. Um, and think differently in these really small designs. So the the plants that were brought in, um, I did some you know simple research of um, reading some some articles and speaking to some people about which plants those could be, and I and I tried to find those which were also somewhat um, I wouldn't say decorative but colorful um, because of course there are many which are grasses and reeds and things, but um, the a lot of canans and all the rest which are also very beautiful flowers that could um, also um uh absorb the 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 toxins that are in the soil or water and the last i think um work that you'd asked about scorch which is a a floor piece and i think we do have an image of that um is basically two types of wood uh which are which are floored um and you'll see the dark color and a lighter color but they're both have been treated with um this Japanese technique of preserving, not preserving, but I guess um, like almost curing wood. So uh, sosiban, which allows then wood to be placed in the exterior and for it to resist um, humidity, etc. But in this and, and really laying um, this kind of floor sculpture um, on the ground, I was also thinking about um, um, soil uh, crop rotations and in certain um parts of the world where there will be an intentional burn of, of um, crops or of um, areas to allow it to settle, to fall, to have these moments of, of letting um, land rest and then to come back to it and to, um, to not have this intense um, pressure on of, um, of yield, um, which seems to to have been the way that we've been thinking a lot about agriculture on, on long and large scale, and especially in mono monocrop agriculture. But at the same time, you know, this was a moment when we were seeing a lot of um, wildfires um, in different parts of the world, and so there's this ambiguity of of you know this out of balance um, environment that you know could you know and seeing these fires going on on um, taking taking um, place all over the world and at the same time thinking but you know there is also this very nutritious uh, kind of I guess oh, um uh soil that is also comes out of the, the the devastation and of course we know there's some plants that that um that appear after um a fire but have not um, existed before but then again there's this point of wanting to, not wanting to, but slowly um, coming back to a more um, balanced um, ecosystem, but going through that stage of um, of almost clearing. So the the work scorches is, is really leaning on both of that those things that ambiguity of of um, of at once nourishing the soil, but then also um, recognizing um, that in some situations that that means you know a loss of um, habitat and, and an ecosystem that is really disturbed. So those were the, the 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 three works that you asked about, and all were kind of um, ways in which I was thinking about, you know, what does um, you know what is out of out of whack. So, you know, there's a lot of things that are whack and out of out of balance, um, and and I didn't want to. And I think Catherine mentioned this this term, the conservationist, and it's true that's something that I think influenced me a lot in my my upbringing of um, you know thinking about the environment and how to to care for it. Um, and as I was reading a bit more, I was thinking about conservationism and, and also the kind of the, the more difficult side of that and, and what it meant about preserving. And, and, and in, in the past, I would say these words, which were, um, I'm thinking more about creating nature reserves and natural parks um, and really thinking about these questions of purity or of, you know, untouched wilderness and things like that, in which it is in a lived uh, space. And I think there's something about that um, narrative, which is not the narrative I think that Catherine is speaking about at all, but that when I was reading some of these older, um, I guess, projects around um, conservation, which I was really weary of this idea of when I think when I was speaking about remediation, it's not at all this quest to 
a perfect landscape or, um, you know, going back to a time um, when things were um, perfect. Um, it's it's really this um, this questioning of how do we do better? You know, how do we um, make sure that everyone, um, it's not an upstream or downstream kind of question of, you know, it's a, at the top, we're doing okay, at the bottom, not so great. Uh, it's more, how do we, you know, eke towards balance? Um, and that that's a lot of work because it slips away again and it's a continually changing thing um, as it changes the seasons, that changes with, you know, the, the larger environment. So those were the three works and I guess the entry points of to my, my thinking at that moment around, um, yeah, around remediation. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Kapwani. Um, I think, especially thinking about Keyhole and Scorched, in a second I'll turn to Catherine, but I wanted to kind of think back to one of the earlier conversations that we had with you and that November painter, the first curator of this project, um, had with you as a kind of starting point, you know, growing up in Hamilton and being aware that the waterfront and the lands around it have been so, um, you know, poisoned by the industry that kept the city uh, flourishing or anyway employed. Um, and its proximity to a greenhouse where all of these beautiful um, plants were grown for enjoyment, for study, maybe very many of them had, you know, remediation potential in some other place where the, they'd been dislocated from. Um, so in a certain sense, um, Southern Africa, the shores of Lake Ontario, many of these landscapes sort of um, came to the fore in this, this early conversation and a question about how to get to a healthy place in a, in a soil system. Um, and Keyhole brings those two stories together in, in such an incredible way. Um, and I wanted to turn to Catherine, thinking about, or to learn a bit more about what role plants might play, what role fire might play in some of the um, soil remediation that you see or engage with, or what what toxins do you see in the environment or work with that you're trying to address when um, conservation, um, the moment for primarily conservation has passed and remediation or restoration need to ensue. Yeah, thank you. Um, plants are uh, amazing. Um, you know, uh, we were talking a little bit about this. It's it's easy to kind of get into this point of of ecological despair when you see the impacts that are happening on our environment. Um, but I am often amazed by um, the different functions that our plant soil systems have and their capacity to to buffer, to to mitigate, to neutralize, and actually degrade a lot of contaminants. Um, and so, uh, in, in a lot of the systems um, that I work with, uh, we're often playing around with those relationships. So. What do we need to do to support, say, uh, soil microbes that might be actively breaking down hydrocarbons in our in our soil system? Um, and are there natural products like like things like biochar, which is a um, a plant it can be made from plant, it can be made from animal materials um, under this really oxygen limited condition that we can add to the soil that helps improve those conditions for those those soil microbes to help degrade things again, like like hydrocarbons. So um, there's there's huge opportunities and phytoremediation. I think we're really just at beginning stages of understanding it. Um, we're just launching into some new work trying to understand particularly how a lot of our common boreal plant species um, might interact with uh, contaminants we would find in tailings um, from uh, a, a gold mine. So looking at how might they interact with things like copper, chromium, um, or zinc or lead in, in other mine sites. Um, and uh, we see this huge capacity uh, of our plants to kind of take care of us. Um, and it, 
that kind of, I think, can resolve these feelings of of despair. You know, our, our plant soil systems um, really have an ability um, to resolve some of the issues of contamination in our environment. But <laughs> um, the challenge really comes, you know, what is the environment those contaminants are coming into, right? So when we have intact plant soil systems, healthy ecosystems in place, this huge self-regulating uh, capacity that uh, the environment has is really well intact. Um, when I worry about uh, contaminants coming into the environment, it's usually in very degraded environments. Mm -hmm. So where some of those key nutrient cycling processes have been wholly disturbed either by, you know, total removal of topsoil, which is a, a really big issue, uh, especially um, with a lot of mines, um, and where we don't have, you know, those natural um, nitrogen and carbon cycling um, processes in place where we've denuded the landscape of, of plants, of vegetation, and so they're not returning that litter into the soil as kind of the carbon engine that's driving those systems. And so when we have contaminants in those degraded landscapes, that becomes uh, a huge challenge. Um, and that's where you've got issues with remediation and restoration sort of um, concurrently. Um, so when I think of Keyhole, I, you know, it, I felt relaxed walking through it. I felt at ease. I was like, oh, here, okay, you know, here's the system. It's It's intact. This is... This is a system that, you know, we never want to see contaminants come into, but um, it's a totally different uh, scenario. Um, and maybe I'll just also touch a little bit on on scorched. Um, uh, I, I very much enjoyed um, uh, walking through that exhibit. Uh, and as soon as I, I walked um, onto the, the wood, I immediately had a memory of um, some work we were doing this summer. So we were up at <clears throat> the Wheeler River, which is kind of near Key Lake in uh, northern Saskatchewan, doing some work in partnership um, with a mine. Um, and uh, it, they're often tasked mines with developing closure and reclamation plans before they even go into operation, which is a really good thing um, because we really need to develop better strategies. And so one of the things that myself and my graduate student did is um, in that landscape, fire is the natural disturbance regime. So it's a, a pine forest with really sandy soils. Um, and so that whole plant soil system has evolved over a huge period of time in this relationship with its natural fire regime. Um, and so when we are often trying to develop strategies and techniques in restoration, one thing we try to do is look at how do these systems recover from natural disturbance? Because they've been built over time to recover from natural disturbance. And sometimes by following those clues, it can tell us, you know, what might be some of the key species to bring in? What might be some of the key factors? And so as I was uh, walking through Scorched, I had this memory of uh, walking with my graduate student through a recently burned um, stand, so one that had just burned uh, this previous summer. Um, and then what we did is we actually visited different stands that had been burned at different periods of time. So one that had was just recovering a year out, one that had burned five years ago, one that had burned 10 years ago, 40 years ago. Um, and through visiting those stands and really observing closely what did we see on the ground, um, what did we see in terms of vegetation that was naturally recovering, we developed the basis of the techniques for her restoration project. Um, so understanding the role of fire uh, in our boreal forest systems and in our prairie systems is, is critical. Um, you know, Graham kind of mentioned this, it's like, try to rebuild a system, right? It's where we realize how little we understand about what's happening um, in plant soil systems is when we actually try to rebuild them. And the natural disturbance regime is all a part of that. Um, so I, I really um, appreciated that in um, in the Scorched exhibit. It made, it, that's where it took me, was into really thinking about um, those natural disturbance regimes and how 
we can use them to help us understand how to actively restore our systems. Um, <clears throat> before we started, you, you said something really stuck with me. Um, you said, you know, a river like the South Saskatchewan River, you know, it's very clear. And I thought, oh, that's nice. You know, it's clear. It looks like a healthy, and you said, no, it should be like chocolate milk. It should be full of these sediments and stuff. So maybe do you want to, I mean, you can start where you want, but maybe unpack that a bit for me because I, I, it's it's a very interesting statement. And you said, you know, there's all these nutrients and sediments that should be coming with the river. So um, starting from there, maybe talk a little bit about, yeah, how is our our waterways doing in this part of the world? You touched upon it a little bit with Cumberland House, but have you have you seen improvements or is it is it going the wrong way? Is it is it getting worse here or is there efforts to try and now that we know that things are maybe not um, as healthy as they could be um people are trying to 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 yeah remediate or, or find ways to restore um healthy river valley or near river system uh yeah so the south saskatchewan river is pretty clean um you know it's great for us living in saskatoon it's very easy to treat the water because it's so clear um when you are in a place where you have more organics in the water um, and then you treat it with chlorine as we do um, that can cause issues with hum human health over time so if you treat organically rich water with chlorine it'll create a kind of a byproduct of that treatment called trihalomethanes and it's not not good for your your digestion over time it can lead to um, some problems with with human health um, so we're kind of lucky in Saskatoon that we have this water resource development system, but then there are consequences to that system for others downstream. So um, particularly in the spring, when the when the water flows are high, you'll notice that the turbidity, so the color of the water goes up. It's, it's carrying more suspended solids, which is giving it that sort of brown chocolate milk color. That's healthy. That's what the river here should look like. Um, if you're up closer to the Rocky Mountains, it's normal for the water to be clear because it's not carrying a lot of bed load. Um, and, you know, that's what rivers do is they sort of carry sediment, they carry oxygen. Um, and the ones that are within like the river within the Delta, you know, it needs to bring that new oxygen into the wetlands off of the main channel of the river, as well as with those nutrients. But what's happening there similar to here is that you have a very clear flow of water coming out of um, the uh, E.B. Campbell Dam. Um, and so that has an impact from, from everything from, you know, the sort of microbacteria in the water to the fish, to the um, like insects, to um, birds it affects everything down the chain. And so we might think from our perspective that this is clean because it's clear, but the reality is that a healthy river in this environment would look different. It would look more of that sort of chocolate, chocolate milk. And so when you see the North Sask and the South Sask where they converge, um, the North Sask actually carries more sediment because there's not as many disruptions in terms of reservoirs. And so what happens in the reservoir is as the water's coming in and it slows down, it drops that sediment. And so we're storing the sediment that's coming in from the sort of prairie landscape in the in Alberta. It's all being stored in Lake Diefenbaker. Um, and then you carry on to Saskatoon and we have a weir here. And so there's even some sediment that's being stored probably four or five kilometers upstream of Saskatoon. And then if you go down to Caudet Reservoir, um, it was actually designed as a sediment trap to keep the sediment from filling up Tobin Lake to preserve the life of that reservoir as a hydropower facility. Um, this cre it creates all kinds of challenges. And if we look to the east, to Lake Winnipeg, um, we might be looking into our future at Lake Diefenbaker. That's a sort of scary thought because as many of you know, Lake Winnipeg has had um, big problems with algae blooms in the last 20 years or so. Um, because it's getting so many nutrients from the Assiniboine uh, and the red going into Lake Winnipeg, uh, mostly from agricultural production in the U.S. And so that once a lake does that, once it becomes heavily eutrophied, it's really hard to put it back. 
And so we should be thinking, you know, about our drinking water over the next 50 years or 100 years and thinking, you know, what do we want our main source of water, which is the is Lake Diefenbaker. That's more than half the province depends on that water body for drinking. Um, you know, what do we want that to look like 50 years from now? And if we don't do something about the nutrients that are being stored at the western end of the reservoir, then we could be in trouble. Um, I think in one of the questions you asked us about, you know, contaminants. And when I think back to keyhole and like how plants can sort of take up okay. and process some of those um, nutrients or heavy metals or um, whatnot, we're, we're working on a project uh, about the Alberta oil sands. So um, there's huge reservoirs, uh, something like the air, an area of Lake Erie full of oil sands processed water and it's growing, you know, it's like getting bigger and bigger as they process. And we have to figure out a way to treat that material before it's released. They're not allowed to release it at this, at this point. And one of the ways is to use engineered wetlands, like constructed treatment wetlands using um, native plants that live in a wetland. And the reason they did this, because accidentally some of that oil sands process water got into one of these wetlands and they noticed that the plants were actually breaking down this naphthenic acid, this long carbon change that can bond to things that are alive in ways that aren't great. But the plants and the the biofilm that lives on the outside of the plants was somehow breaking this stuff down. And so they're trying to understand, can we build these things? Can we build like a, a treatment system using plants to, to actually treat oil sands processed water? And it'd be maybe only one of probably a dozen different solutions to deal with oil sands processed water. But what's interesting is we, we're working on the sort of governance, ethical, legal, and social dimension of that project. And when we talk to Indigenous communities who are around those facilities and we ask them, you know, about, you know, what do they think of this approach to dealing with oil sands processed water? And they, you know, the question that might not occur to me as a, you know, a sort of Western settler person is, should we be uh, putting the plants to this kind of work? Like, should we allow them to do that for us? Um, that's not a question that occurred to me, like, but it has occurred to people who are still, I think maybe they remember what it's like to be connected to the land in a different way. Like these things around us, they are part of us. It's not separate. Um, so when I walked into Keyhole, I thought, wow, this is like a great example of um, the sort of, you know, putting plants to work in a sort of you know, in like a, in like a, um, a constructed environment, like here, this is not what the plants would look like in nature, but this is what we do as we sort of construct these things for our, you know, for our benefit because we've created all these problems. So that, that was, I was thinking about so many things. I love this exhibit, um, but that was one of the ones that really jumped out at me is just like walking through keyhole and thinking, you know, these plants, like, do they like it here? You know, are they happy? Like, I know that we don't know. I if think so. Think so I think way. there've been, uh, it's been very, I mean, I think one of the really interesting things about working with Capone on the show is like, it's, it's been challenging, you know, it's challenging to keep, plants alive in a very hostile environment in the middle of winter when they really don't want to be, they want to be hibernating, they don't want to be growing and they don't want to be. So it's it's sort of a so almost like an institutional challenge for us. So we've had a number of staff have to have um, now plant babies and their cubicles and grow lights and to try and, you know, keep everything going. Um, so I think, but that's also interesting because again, it's like makes us as an institution really think about like, what are we doing? We're used to taking care of dead objects or animate objects. And here we're dealing with living things and we're far less good taking care of living things than non-living things. So, um, but again, you know, um, Lyndon Linklater, uh, knowledge keeper and indigenous um, relationship advisor here, you know, in, in his belief system in, in Plains Cree and Ojibwe, he believes rocks are living things you know they they are considered living in creek culture so you know again that that our western divide of what's what's you know what's living and what's not living is um it's depends on perspective thank you here kapwan yeah yeah jumping in no no i was just i was very um happy to hear graham um kind of uh i think voice some of the 
the questions that happen when you're making an exhibition like this and kind of going, like, can I can I do this? Can these plants be here? Is that okay? Um, and there's that there are ethical questions because if we're really asking about, you know, um, and I think that's what also you you brought up on is the, this idea of of care, which um needs is really one of the ingredients that is, I guess, or the materials that's invisible but also felt is that people really need to consider, be aware of, and think about, you know, these bringing life into an institution, the usual museums and, and exhibition spaces are often, you know, for, you know, they don't always support life as best as, as, as they could. So it's, it was a real question for me, you know, should I be with Keyhole, should I have these plants here at all? Um, and then looking through, I was like, well, you know, what is it that these plants are doing? And, and in this case of like, you know, in the remediation systems, and I was really, you know, there's another work in the exhibition called um, Residue, and and that was really inspired by the um, the difficulties of in French, it's cruel decode, which I think it has another term which I've forgotten now um, in English, but basically this is um, pesticide that can't be broken down, and there's been what I've understood, and and I'm, you know, very much. Um, uh, yeah, it's kind of self-taught in this way from just reading different articles that there are some tests um, or some research trying to be done with, you know, mosses and different microorganisms to try to break down this pesticide that seems to not be able to be uh, broken down. And it kind of stemmed out of that idea of, well, what, what is already here? What is already kind of, you know, as as Catherine kind of mentioned, protecting us or is um, keeping um, a balance in the ecosystem that I wasn't aware of because I didn't know what were phyto mediators. And so I started to look into these different um, plants that kind of appear um, and have been doing this work, um, <clears throat> quote unquote, without being asked to. Um, but the question of then, you know, in our solutions to try to balance out or to make a, a more livable environment is to continually question ourselves are we, you know, using different tools but repeating the same mind? Um, mindset in which everything serves us, they serve a purpose, and it's not a, a cyclical um, relationship. And so that was one of the, the the challenges I did have with Keyhole myself. Um, so I'm glad that you brought it up, and it's 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 meant to also be, I, I think, a an unresolved question. Um, at one point, it's kind of the podium to say, "Look at these wonderful, you know, um, members of of the of the world that do this this these great things and are beautiful." Uh, you know, to look at, but also have this great function. Let's recognize and let's see this for those who aren't, you know, um, trained or know so much about um, about this. But at the same time, bringing them into an environment that is not their own is is a is a, a pull. So, anyways, it's, it's these questions about how do we how do we reconsider our place in the world? How do we think about restructuring, rearchitecturing our ways of relating to one another and to our environment? And it's, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it was my, my main kind of, I think, uh, conundrum uh, that I was leaving with the, the audience as well, I hope. Um, so, yeah. Um, I'm going to reverse the order of the questions we had planned because I think there's a really nice flow on from uh, what you've described in terms of, you know, for the purpose of your art practice, for your work, for your own um, interests, you're looking for answers to ecological, scientific questions. And, um, you know, you you draw very widely in your research from different sources. Um, they inform your production. I think you're, uh, the way you write and speak about your work. Can you talk about... Um, the role of research and um, the sources that you draw from uh, and the way that they impact your work a little bit. I think one piece in the show where you really see an extraordinary intersection of human history, um, botany, and and so many um, other fields really is maybe with the Marias, um, can you speak a little bit about research and touch upon that work? Yeah, sure. I think we might have an image of uh, the Marias, and I can talk about that. Um, so it's it's uh, it's of course quite embarrassing for me to talk about research in front of real researchers. 
<laughs> um, so artistic research is, is always quite different. And I, I do consider research to be, you know, sitting and looking at, you know, how to get your line straight, or if you don't want it to be straight, straight, that's artistic research too. spending time in the, in one studio or on one kitchen's table and just being intentional about something. So for me, that is research. It's not something that is needs to be, um, you know, too glorified. Um, but I do really enjoy, I, and I just ask questions. I'm just curious. And I kind of figure like, how do we get, how did we get to where we are now? And so history plays a big part in that. And so I look kind of at historical documents and archives and all of that are really important to inspire me. And when I have the time and other people on the other end have time too, I try to reach out to experts in fields and, and you know, ask questions or listen to read their work, of course, and um, when I can be in conversation. So there's different kind of, I guess, layers of research. And it's I often have questions that will, um, I think, never be left, but just be put aside for a moment and then I'll come back to them and I'll dig deeper into, you know, maybe one strand. Um, so I often work in chapters and this chapter around toxicity and and um, in the natural world has been, I, you know, been doing it for some time and, and it's still continuing. But each time I do a new project, there's maybe a new tangent that that comes on or I, I go deeper into, into that. So for the Maria is what you see here. Um, uh, is a yellow environment, and that's important. I'll talk about that later. Um, and these kind of you know, almost tear-dropped um, pedestals. And on those um, two paper sculptures um, of a plant, you know, commonly known as a peacock flower, in two different stages of development. Um, and I was working on another exhibition, and, and I was interested in... in I don't know exactly how it came it came across, but I, I was looking at plants, but Suriname kept on coming back in a lot of the research I was doing at that time. And <clears throat> and reading through um um some some different botanists who had traveled um from Britain, sorry, not, not Britain. This is larger than that. So the three different places. So there was, I think we would have at this point, there would have been Dutch, um, French and English um, botanists would have all written about the peacock flower in Suriname, but not everyone had mentioned, um, not all of these botanists had mentioned uh, its use as an abortative. So this particular plant um, was used by um, Indigenous communities and then communities who were brought over um, from Africa uh, to work um, in conditions of slavery as a plant that would allow um, people to abort. Um, and that knowledge, um, of course, was was shared, um, sometimes recorded, um, sometimes hidden uh, in the, the kind of the official quote unquote um, uh, writings of the, the botanists. But it was important for me to, um, to try to, I guess, unite um, different concurrent realities in this particular um, installation, sculptural installation. And so first, you know, finding out about it's the use of this plant as an ally um, in quest for liberation or self-determination um, of protecting or at least making choices over one's body um, was one of the things I wanted to, to touch on. But choosing to work with um, paper sculptures was always also... Um, acknowledging um, another reality, which were, you know, Victorian women who at that particular time had this kind of hobby, um, more affluent women, a hobby of, of making paper flowers to, um, to keep them busy, I think, but also to make, you know, these um, decorations for their homes. And so these concurrent kind of um, uh, realities were happening. And at the same time, there was the um, Maria Siribe, uh, who was, the botanist who I spoke about, but also the naturalist um, illustrator, um, who uh, you know was the first to really observe and, and scientifically the metamorphoses of, of um, insects and in, into um, larvae and to, to butterflies, etc., um, was also kind of key in this um, understanding of the the peacock flower because her her drawings and mentions of the the abortive were part of the research so these three kind of i guess um um realities and also research into different i guess lives that were happening in a global generally same moment uh, all informed um 
the form, the materials used, um, and the story told, I would say. So um, with all of the things I choose, as you've seen in the exhibition here too, the materials already are um, carriers of history or of stories. And I, I try to shape them in such ways that they can speak for themselves. I mean, people don't always have the backstory to all of this, but I trust also in materials um, kind of carrying on um, histories of of where they've come from, what they've been through. Um, and of course, it might not be the material that's directly in front of us, but at least from its its um, lineage, if one can say that. Um, and so, you know, the use of the paper flower is important. And, and I didn't, I said I would get back to the yellow. And so the, the yellow kind of um, was really um, to, to kind of, I guess, hint to or um, yeah, hint to this idea of, of sunshine. And we often have this, this very, um, depending on you're standing, but the idea of the, the, the Caribbean or the, the Southern and Central Americas really seen as this kind of tropical, um, happy um, space. And this, this yellow, when you're in the space itself, is at once joyful and also very um, intense, um, as with, I think, the, the beauty of these flowers and their, and their potential um, to... Yeah, their potent potential, I would say. So there's this um, again, this push and pull between um, um, how we choose to to use um, what nature provides uh, for us, and this question, I guess, which we've been talking about already, is this: certain toxins at one point can heal uh, in too too large doses. They could, of course. Um, uh, have another effect so it's this this question of knowing um in what moment um a certain material needs to be used and in what dose um as well yeah thanks Caponi. <clears throat> it's interesting this is kind of a maybe a, a little bit of a loaded question but it in a way it's kind of like we're sitting here with two um academics researchers and people who work in community and um you know, as artists, as Kapwani described, like she, she has all these stories and knowledge and research, but sometimes she sh decides not to share it. And a lot of artists do that. They they have a lot of, they do a lot of research and background, and then they present something to an audience, and they might insist on not having any of that revealed to the audience. How do you, as researchers, whose big part of your job is sort of like finding out something, but then also kind of um, I guess, sort of sharing that, you know, teaching it, writing articles, writing books about it, you know, um, I mean, Art, how do you, how, yeah, I mean, you seem to both have kind of been, been kind of, uh, your, your, you were both kind of, um, yeah, engaged by the exhibition, but maybe, can you say something about it, how it's, you know, how, how do you, do you think, uh, is art an interesting and kind of maybe even effective form to kind of convey some of these ideas? Because I think a lot of people have a hard time um, grappling with very complex uh, ideas, you know, especially kind of in academic lingo. And I think there's a sort of an immediate effect, especially with visual art, music and others that can kind of convey complex concept in a way that maybe gets people in a different way. I don't know. Like whoever feels like they want to attempt to answer that uh, somewhat um, loaded question, maybe, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there, I think maybe what you're kind of asking is there, um, is there a, a, a place for artistic work in this conversation? And um, absolutely, you know, I, one of the, excellent things about being, uh, I guess, trained as a, a Western scientific researcher is that we do this research, you know, and, and underlying that we always say, okay, it's, it's free from values, which is probably entirely not true, but the idea is that it's supposed to be, and that we have objectives that are measurable, and we try to, you know, answer these questions. And it, it's a, it's a system of knowing, right? And it's a, it's a very useful system of knowing and has, um, uh, had a lot of good outcomes, um, but there's also been many not great outcomes. Uh, and I think one of the things that I've really come to understand is that um, 
especially in restoration practice, um, it can't be valueless. So we can't move restoration practice and the concepts around it forward without engaging in conversations around values. Um, and so I, I think the place for me where I feel like um, art can uh, play such an amazing role is that it can put us in a place where we ask questions about values, where we ask all those relational questions. What's our relationship to um, this environmental impact we're having? What's this relationship with using plants to clean it up for us, <laughs> right? I mean, I, and I think that you're right. What uh, art can sometimes do is it does it in this very sort of uh, direct, sort of visceral way um, that, gets rid of all the jargon that we love in our scientific world. Um, and so, you know, I, I do think about that a lot when I train uh, folks to go out into the world to be uh, restoration practitioners. I say you have to understand the values um, that are associated with every project. And that includes your personal values. That includes, you know, the uh, socioeconomic values, the cultural and spiritual values, um, and the ecological values. And all four of those kind of different sectors are totally critical. And, and I think artwork pushes that conversation forward. And we need that conversation in order to find better ways forward and better solutions. Um, great answer. Yeah, great <laughs> answer. That's very really good. Um, I feel really lucky that I've had a chance to work with artists on trying to express the knowledge that we're learning, like about the Delta or other places where we've worked. Um, because in the science world, we tend to constrain knowledge rather than like expand it. Um, I don't know if that's how to make that any more clear, but when we see things um, that are created by artists, maybe trying to convey something that scientists have learned, it tends to reach a lot more people than just the, the small audience of, you know, a handful of other academics in your field who are really interested in your work. Um, and in that, in those collaborations that we've done over the last 10 years, some of them have really um, connected with people far more than like our PowerPoint presentations or our papers. Uh, one one example that um, we did, and I this was a whole huge team of people that, that put this ex exhibition together, which was kind of focused on river deltas, not just the SAS Delta, but also the Peace Athabasca and the Slave. And one of the pieces in it that connected with people was... Uh, uh, taking the river flow over a hundred years and turning it into sound. So in science, we typically default to visualization as our tool to represent knowledge, like charts, graphs, pictures, et cetera. But sound is like a whole other sense that connects with people in a really different way than a visualization. So people could hear the flow of the river. And so every year was like a pulse, essentially like a heartbeat. But then when the sixties come, when the dams go in, it's like a heartbeat with an arrhythmia. And so it goes from kind of like, I'll try to imitate the sound if I can. It was like up until the 60s. And then once the 60s hit, it goes. Whoosh. So it's like a heart without the luster of a functioning heart. And that connected with people um, far more than any of our papers or uh, PowerPoint presentations. So I feel like there's a growing space for that kind of collaboration. And something that Kapwani said that, you know, artists do research. And, and I would say that research is just a form of experimentation, like whether you're an artist or a scientist. And you know, as an artist, you might try experimenting with materials or forms or lighting, or there's so many ways of experimenting to try and connect a particular idea to people. And I've learned that working 
with artists, the best way, like as a scientist to work with the artists is to say, here's what I've learned as a scientist. Here's some resources, go and do whatever you want to do. Not like, I need you to make this picture for me. That's often how scientists approach artists is to say, we want you to illustrate this idea. But that leads to a very shallow collaboration and it doesn't necessarily create like the, the, uh, you know, the art that really impacts people where they're like, they're sort of stopped, you know, in their tracks by, by experiencing it, whatever it is, whether it's sound or, or visual art. I think that to make those collaborations between science and art really fruitful is not instrumentalizing the art, but giving this the artist whoever you're working with the space so that they can bring whatever craft whatever medium they want to express the idea through them rather than you know like we probably the most common art science collaborations that we see in the media is like planets drawn by you know an artist like representing sort of that image so that it's not just like a fuzzy pixelated picture but that's kind of still instrumentalizing and not really exploring like the full value and when those collaborations become really fruitful what's so exciting is that it's brand new knowledge you know it's something that's never been done it's never been thought it's never been created before and then all these other people can come and see it and experience it and they then become part of that new knowledge and that's like for, to me, those are the best, most exciting parts of my job is like when someone, you know, when all that, all that stuff that has to happen for a piece to get to like this, it's so much work and people might come through and like walk through quickly. But if they knew about everything that led to that work being there, they'd probably pause a little bit longer and really be able to like unpack it. What's happening in them. And I think the challenge we have today in general with art is most people have forgot how to just take in a piece of art. They've sort of, they they feel like it's not for them because they're not an artist. And that's, it's like somebody, I think it was Jake said to me, Jake Moore said a while ago, she said, any piece of art is like a gesture. What does it stir in you? You know, how, how you respond to it is okay. There's no right way or wrong way. And I feel like that's, we need, we need art more in society than ever, like now than ever, because there's so many grand challenges and art can express that in ways that science can't. So uh, yeah, sorry, rambling a bit there. That's wonderful. Thanks. I was going to throw a surprise uh, last question in from over here, just wondering if there are, um, calls to action from any of our panelists. And I was thinking more like plant such and such in your yard to help with this project or when you're by the river, you know, do whatever. But I think the call to action, we need more art and we need to remember and trust that your encounter and your um, experience, the thought, the feeling, that visceral encounter um, to encourage that, I think that's terrific call to action. I, I Being also, as I am a museum person, I'm, but <laughs> our, our, just I want to give Kapwani if you have a, a call to action for listeners or those present or or Catherine, and it can be um, health of the world or community related, not just um, let art spark your thinking. Um, a call to action. Um, I, I think really, um, my call to action would be to encourage people to, um, to open their minds, um, and to become aware that the way that you might see the world is only one way, um, and open that possibility that through kind of different ways of knowing and different knowledge systems, um, there could be a new way forward. That would be my call to action. Thanks so much, Catherine. And Kapwani, 
Was there anything well, you wanted to add? Well, I think mine are, are quite similar. It's kind of, you know, be curious. And um, I think the the reason why I put so much energy into, um, into making art is because I think that there is intelligence there that are not always academic or they're not always, can always be articulated. There are things that are felt in the body. And, and if we're talking about remediation of our environment, I mean, we can't pretend that we're not part of that um, and that harm hasn't been done to us as, as individuals, but also as communities and groups and, and whatever, however you know large you want those groups to be. And I think they're all concentric circles in terms of when we talk about group or community. And so um, I think, you know, trying to, <laughs> I guess, uh, to allow those space to to be curious and to to feel and to trust in the things that 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 we have experienced and that we feel in our bodies. So that's what I think art does for me is it allows those intelligences to grow. And I think that influences the actions um, that materialize in how we structure towns and cities and countries and electrical dams, all of those things. Um, so yeah, I think it's 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 also just this um trying to reconnect, which maybe has been been broken up and compartmentalized a bit too much. I'll be thinking about all those dead fish every time I shower now in the morning. I'm gonna be like, I'm gonna be really like imagining all these dead fish on the on you the shore. Shower at lunch hour. Yeah, lunch hour or maybe shower less in general, but that's just um that'll be that'll be my I'll be trying to shower less. Um flush the toilet less. Are there any burning questions in the audience or oh Carol's got a roving mic if there are folks who want to ask questions of Kapwani, Catherine, or Graham, before we close this conversation. Are there any online, Kyle? Oh, Linda. Specifically for Kapwani, and I'm really interested in how much information you uh, want the audience to have. And I'm thinking about the, the piece right here because I think it was shown here earlier without the information. Could have been. When it was first shown, like the significance uh, of the plants. Um, maybe the label was more discreet the first time around. <laughs> I think it was very discreet. And I guess I'm, so I'm asking Kipwani, how does she yeah. see that in terms of? Do you want people to, quote, get it? Or, you know, how do you handle that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I hope that the work, like every work that I do is an invitation, um, an invitation to feel something or to be curious or kind of go, hey, what, what's this all about? And then I leave it to the visitor to decide what they want to do with it. Do they want to do the research themselves? Do they want to ask more questions? Or do they want to just kind of say, that was nice, and continue on? So I think um, I prefer the responsibility to be with the individual. Um, and of course, the museums or the, the context in which people are showing it mediate that in some ways. And I think if the question comes, people are able to respond to that. Um, but I don't also want to take away from the just the experience of being in, in a space and maybe having a different interpretation um, or a connection, which I think, again, is beyond words, uh, which is beyond... Um, uh, yeah, which is, again, I think privileging that other intelligence, which is not always, we can't always articulate. If that answers your question, please tell me if it doesn't, I can try to. Well, I, I'll tell you, the next step is, to what degree are you leaving some of those decisions up to the institution? Mm. Um. I think not much because I think there's a, lo a lot of times when the, the wall text and all this, I'm, uh, uh, I often see before they, they go out. I think when I'm no longer on this earth, I don't know what will happen and how these things will be interpreted. But I think that um, when I'm working with an, um, an institution and even when there's a, an acquisition of a work or whatever, there is um, the wall text is already um decided upon. And so those are the, the language that I'm happy to have used. Um, and then at one point it goes out into the world, it's no longer yours and and, um, and things can get changed and framed in different ways. Um, so I just, you know, 
when I'm in conversation with people, there's a trust that that people understand. And we've had conversations about how I want the work to be um, framed. Um, and that sometimes you, can, you you don't know how people are going to, to recontextualize things. Um, so apart from, you know, trying to have the, the wall text in a, in a way that I find acceptable, um, there's not much more I feel that I can I can do apart from trusting that the work itself will communicate something and my my intention. And so what I try to do the most is just to be as clear with my intentions when I make something. Um, so that hopefully will transmit and that will go beyond words or and all the rest, I would hope. But um, as we know, things can be interpreted in many ways. Um, and that's really the, the work on the other side of the individual to, to decide how they want to interpret it. And sometimes things will be interpreted in ways that I do not like at all. But that is also someone else's own history and their own story that I am not really a part of. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Kapwani. Um, are there any one last question or we will otherwise say a very big thank you to Kapwani, Graham, Catherine. It's been wonderful talking with all of you and thanks to everyone for coming and our team for yeah, putting this event thanks together. Thanks to Kyle and Carol for making this happen. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, everyone.